So um, now we'll move on to the afternoon um, speakers. Aha, uh -huh. Dr. Troy Lungs. All right, I'll moderate uh, part of this session. So uh, I'm Troy Lund. I am one of the physicians at the University of Minnesota. I'm a, uh, involved in uh, the uh, Lucadir Stiffy Clinic there. I'm also a bone marrow transplant specialist and specialize in transplantation of, of ALD. So I'm going to start the session with uh, kind of a, uh, an update on some new biomarkers and new clinical trial uh, that we're doing and just discuss the, the role of allotransplants for cerebral disease. Disclosures, I'll discuss uh, preliminary results from uh, Magenta Therapeutics, which is a sponsored clinical trial uh, at our institution and a couple others now. So these are uh, some of the earliest uh, survival graphs uh, looking at uh, children with uh, ALD who underwent bone marrow transplant. Um, we have survival probability on the y-axis, and uh, then we have time on the x-axis, and these are transplanted uh, boys up here, non-transplanted boys down here. So from 2007, obviously a stark difference. And then in our own population, uh, we looked at boys who underwent transplant with a less score less than 10, those with greater, of, greater than 10, and we do see the survival differences noted there. Uh, those with uh, reduced amounts of disease do much, much better. And in fact, those with uh, a low less score who undergo a matched sibling transplant have 100% survival. Um, um, so we've identified kind of the ideal conditions uh, for transplant, of the, f the foremost being early uh, in the disease process. <clears throat> So, but we now want to go beyond survival because that was a historic outcome and it comes from the uh, oncology field. All of us transplanters are trained in, in childhood cancer or adult cancer. And so we're very, uh, we customarily look at just being alive or not alive as an outcome. But for CLD, we have to do better than that and start looking at neurologic outcomes. So the one thing I want to bring up is uh, some of the pathophysiology. So when we talk about cerebral disease, we're talking about active cerebral inflammation. And we see that on an MRI with the gadolinium given, or, uh, the contrast agent. And we see this garland ring of enhancement. This is what we consider to be active cerebral disease. Uh, normally, this ring should not be there. It is an indicator that the blood brain barrier is broken. Uh, that barrier should keep lots of proteins, including gadolinium, inside your bloodstream. When it's broken, you're usually undergoing a process of inflammation, and the dye leaks out and gives a signal. Um, this can happen in cerebral disease. There's a variety of other diseases it happens with. It also happens with brain tumors and things like that. Uh, this was a young uh, boy 10 days prior to transplant. So we also have to talk about uh, demyelination, and we have to talk about um, uh, what else is going on in the brain. So this is a normal MRI here, just so you can see what it looks like. This is an MRI with uh, uh, T2, what we call T2 or D T2 signal or demyelination signal. So this is damage to the underlying neurons uh, that result in this signal change. It's basically shows up as a white color on the MRI. Uh, and then surrounding it usually is this garland ring of contrast enhancement or in proximity to it. So, so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, T2 signal and uh, contrast enhancement. Um, this is the stuff that we put the less score on. Uh, and I'll talk uh, about that in the next slide about what the less score is. But first of all, you know, we talk a lot about transplant and the blood-brain barrier and, and what is it, its role and how is it working. The, the truth is we really don't know how it's working. What we know is that the blood-brain barrier is broken in cerebral disease and there's a variety of inflammatory signals that are uh, ongoing both in the bloodstream and in the brain matter and these signals go back and forth. There is swelling, there is fluid leakage, there is contrast leakage as I mentioned. This is all occurring in a complex milieu. But, and then we know that after transplant, this all seals up and that contrast enhancement goes away and we put the disease in remission, hopefully with minimal advancement. And so then the inflammation is attenuated for again, reasons we don't understand. 
So to summarize in text, uh, we know that demyelination is progressive. Uh, steroids and immune suppressants can only slow the destruction and it does it temporarily in boys. I have a long list of factors I've tried in boys that have failed. Um, we know that the blood-brain barrier is broken and we know that the only rest, a way to arrest the disease to date is bone marrow transplant. Uh, and so what are we going for in transplant? Again, this is the gadolinium enhancement on MRI 10 days prior to transplant. This is the same boy, 30 days after transplant, you can see that the enhancement's completely gone. Um, uh, and that's what we call disease remission. Uh, and that's the goal for every transplant. So we wanted to figure out what are the factors associated with that gadolinium resolution, because we felt that was a key factor uh, or the factor in disease remission. So we looked at the last uh, 66 boys at our transplant center. Uh, these are their demographics here. The median age of transplant was about eight. The baseline uh, median less score was nine. We have an intensity score that is two. You can see the cerebral spinal fluid protein level here. Uh, most of the boys went through a myeloblative transplant. Some were non-myeloblative. A variety of donor sources were used, umbilical cord blood, unrelated donors, and then sibling donors. We had two parents in the group. Uh, any, uh, any gene therapy can, uh, transplants were excluded in this group. Um, and then the cell doses are given here for the product uh, in terms of the total cell dose, stem cell dose, uh, and the other demographics. So the other thing uh, I should mention is uh, we have the scoring system, the less score where, where that is a score from zero to 34 based on the number of structures involved uh, when you look at the T2 signal. And so this would be an example of someone with a low less score. And then as more structures get involved, that score goes up. And so this is what we're talking about when we're talking about low versus high scores, just so you can have something to see. And then we have the gadolinium intensity score that we looked at where we uh, compare the intensity of the white gadolinium to uh, the choroid plexus. And we have a very crude scale, 0, 1, 2, and 3, uh, to grade that, 0 being no signal, 1 being uh, reduced signal, and 3 being bright. It's not the greatest scoring system in the world, but we have published that it, is, uh, it, can, it can be a valid way of looking at things. And the other thing I have to tell you is neutrophil count. So what happens when you give somebody chemotherapy? Well, we monitor the neutrophils um, most often. And so when you monitor the neutrophils in the peripheral blood, during chemotherapy, you can get some induction because it's inflammatory. And then they all go to zero. Uh, and then this actually some, this often occurs a little bit after the transplant day. So actually when the transplant's going in, you actually still have some of your own neutrophils circulating, but they're usually dying out. Um, and then you have this transition from your own neutrophils uh, to the donor neutrophils, and they'll start recovering somewhere around 10 days after transplant, and then they'll just keep on going. Uh, at least that's the goal. So I wanted to define what it is we look at when we talk about neutrophil count, and we have a cutoff of 500 neutrophils when we say somebody's recovered uh, from their transplant, which will be important. So. The first question I asked is, when does that gadolinium go away? When, when does that happen after transplant? We do lots and lots of MRIs at our institutions, so we're able to, to evaluate that. And so by 30 days after transplant, 40% of the patients have no more gadolinium. By 60 days after transplant, about another 40%. And by 100 days, almost 100% of the patients, something like 96% of the patients have no gadolinium. And uh, these are successfully engrafted patients. If you have graft failure during transplant, during transplant, which can happen, I also looked at those patients and whether or not their gadolinium resolved. And they had markedly reduced rates uh, if they had graft failure. So the gadolinium did not disappear. So there's something fundamental about that transplanted product that um, assisted with the gadolinium disappearing. 
And then I always mention that in, these, uh, in this cohort of boys, we never see the gadolinium come back. Once it's gone, it's gone for good. And that's slightly different than what is reported in the gene therapy trial, where, this, where there's a gadolinium reemergence. And so sometimes there's a bit of, we call it a flicker, that gadolinium shows up on the MRI again. It doesn't show up in the same way. It's not a bright white ring in the brain, but it shows up in a reduced quality and is much more subtle. But we do keep track of it. It's not clear what it means physiologically. It's not clear if it's detrimental or if it's associated with outcomes. But it is interesting to note biologically that it is observed uh, in gene therapy and in allo transplant, we never see this. So it's a question that still remains to be answered. So now let's go and look at gadolinium resolution and when the neutrophils were completely recovered. Uh, or at least above that 500 level. So if you look at the patients who resolve their gadolinium early within 30 days, you can see that there's a, a trend toward earlier recovery, um, a median day of being about uh, 18. If you look at all the patients that resolve gadolinium by day 60, you can see most of those patients had a day of recovery at about 16. So they actually engrafted or recovered a lot faster than those without uh, resolution. If you carry it out to 100, uh, again, the faster you recovered your neutrophils, um, the better the results for the MRI. There's another way to look at this is that I split the patients into two group by the median day of neutrophil recovery, which was day 16. Those that recovered their neutrophils faster than 16 days, I called faster, and those that recovered them slower, I just called slower. And then we looked at the percent of patients that had their gadolinium go away. And it turns out, uh, obviously you can see there are marked differences between those that recovered faster, uh, almost 60%, versus those that recovered slower at day 30. And this trend continues all the way out to about day 180. And as you may have noticed, almost everybody resolves their gadolinium by day 180. Um, and so these curves end up meeting. But it's a different way to display the same data. So the other thing we have to answer is whose neutrophils are they? Because there's recipient and there's donor. You want them all to be donor. Sometimes you get a mixed picture where you got some donor in there and you got some recipient and we can measure that and tease that apart. Uh, and so we measured uh, the donor status and I grouped the patients into two groups. Either they were 70 to 100% donor in their neutrophils or they were less than 70. Then I looked at the gadolinium resolution and it turns out that if you are donor engrafted, you have a much higher chance of having the gadolinium be resolved than if you're not donor engrafted. Uh, as you can see, comparing the 70 versus 100 group to the less than 70 group. And these data were si significantly different. And so what it means is that not only do you want to engraft faster, you actually want to engraft with the donor cells. And so then we put all of the data into multiple univariate and multivariate analyses. Uh, and I didn't go through all the different graphs and univariate, but I just give you the p-values uh, uh, p as shown here. So we looked at age that didn't make a difference between those who resolved their gadolinium by six, day 60 and those did not. Gadolinium uh, intensity score actually did make a difference. So the brighter that gadolinium was, uh, the longer it took to go away, and perhaps because the blood-brain barrier is more broken or more open. Uh, that's speculation, but it, it, it does make sense to me. The pre-transplant less score uh, was just barely significant at 0.05. The preparative regimen made a difference. So more intense therapy, the patients tend to close the blood-brain barrier faster. Uh, I looked at the uh, chimerism status, as I just showed you. And then I looked at the neutrophil engraftment, which is what we've been talking about. Platelet recovery didn't matter, and the cell doses uh, in this uh, analysis didn't matter, nor did CNS protein. And then we do a multivariate analysis, so we put all the significant variables into a pot. We see which variable comes out as the most critical thing. Uh, the gadolinium intensity score, so how bright that gadolinium signal, turns out to be very important. And it's probably worthy of more exploration and what that means. 
And then, as I just uh, showed you, is that when you account for everything, neutrophil recovery remains a significant faster, uh, factor. So you want to recover faster and with donor cells. And so the other thing I tried to answer is why is this important? Does it have any neurologic outcomes? So we relied on uh, Jerry Raymond's neurologic function scale, which is a measure of neurologic dysfunction. And so when we evaluate boys, you get points for each level of dysfunction. So if the boy uh, has visual field cuts, they get a point. If they have running difficulties, they get a point. Spastic gait gets two points. Wheelchair gets two points, and on and on and on. Um, interestingly, if you have a two points for wheelchair, you also get all the other points below it. So it's not a linear scale, it's, it's more of a, almost an exponential scale, um, incontinency, et cetera. So more points is worse and a, a lower score is better. So if I looked at those that resolved their gadolinium at day 60 and just said, was it yes or was it no, what is their uh, functional score one year after transplant? Well, if they resolve their gadolinium, their score is actually much lower uh, compared to if they did not resolve their gadolinium. Uh, you can see the p-value there, and the score is about half. So those boys did a lot better if they had um, resolution of the gadolinium. And then the other thing I looked at was the change in the neurologic function score. If you have a score of eight, you're pretty affected. And if you go up to a score of nine, you're still really affected, but the delta there is only one point. What is more concerning are the boys that are one, and then they end up with a score of eight. That's a gain of seven points. That's, that's really critical and um, detrimental to, to the patient and the family. So we looked at that delta from pre-transplant to one year, asked the same question. It looks like when gadolinium went away by day 60, in this group of boys, their change in their score was actually also lower uh, versus those that did not resolve their gadolinium. And so this goes to show that, yeah, probably that resolution of gadolinium, it's probably important. And what's linked to it is donor and neutrophil recovery as fast as possible. So one thing we know that's fundamental to uh, most transplant studies across the world is cell dose uh, the higher the cell dose you give, the faster you recover. And so this is recovery on the y-axis, and this is the stem cell dose we give. And you can see the higher the dose, the shorter the recovery time. And this is the total, uh, uh, total nucleated cell dose. Again, the higher the dose in the product, the shorter that recovery time. Some of the recovery times were uh, down to 10 days. And this just happens to be when the first time we start even checking. So that made us think, is there a way to get higher and higher cell doses? Most of our patients undergo cord blood transplant, and there are a lot of emerging technologies out there now to try to expand that cord blood. And so uh, we've been working with Magenta Therapeutics on a, on a small molecule. Uh, it's an AHR antagonist that's been published. It was published in 2010 in a landmark article. And when you take the cord blood out of its bag and you put it in a cell culture vessel with cytokines and growth factors for two weeks, and then you add this small molecule, you can expand the stem cells in that cord blood uh, up to 50 to 100 fold, sometimes as high as 300 fold. And we thought, well, if we can get that many stem cells, we should be testing it in these patients. And so this is just a brief paradigm of how it's done. Uh, we've just, just completed the cohort one, which is fresh cells. Uh, and so again, the cord blood is taken out of its bag and it's put in a culture vessel and culture with cytokines and factors plus um, the small molecule, MGTA456, cultured for about 14 weeks before it's infused into the patient. And then we follow the patient for the next year to see how, they're, how they are doing. And so we did the first cohort at our institution. Now the second cohort's open at Duke, Emory, and Cincinnati. Uh, and these are the variety of endpoints we're looking at. And just as some example data, this is the expansion of uh, the stem cells in the cord blood. This is pre-expansion, and this is a log scale. So these stem cells are expanding uh, over 100-fold, which is remarkable in terms of stem cell expansion. And then we looked at engraftment. Uh, now this is in mice, so this is preclinical data, but this is how unexpanded cord blood engrafts in mice. And you can see in expanded cord blood, uh, they engraft much, much faster. Um, 
And then we also looked at the engraftment of brain cells. Uh, in this case, it's microglia, which really does not occur very well in mice when you use an un unexpanded cord. But when we use an expanded cord in those mice, the doses are so high, uh, we can increase microglial engraftment in the brains of those mice. Um, and it's, it's many times over because the, the unexpanded cord barely engrafts. <clears throat> and then finally, in, in, in just a, f uh, a handful of kids, five, we've, we've looked at the duration of neutropenia, so how low the neutrophils got, got after their transplant, and uh, the dotted line is the historic control uh, and how long that uh, low neutrophil count lasted. You can see in the, in the expanded cord, it barely lasts uh, for a few days, and the depth of neutropenia is, is not very long, so it helps us with safety and prevention against infection. We looked at platelet recovery, which is shown here, but there's no historic control. And then we looked at days in the hospital. So historically, patients might stay in at about 30 days, uh, so that's about four weeks or so. Uh, using the expanded product in five patients, the median uh, stay was only 19 days, so almost in half, but not quite. And then in, so we had a variety of patients in the first cohort. Two of them had cerebral ALD, and their MRIs are shown here. Uh, Pre-transplant MRIs are given here, and again, we're showing the contrast enhancement in the corpus callosum, as shown by the red arrows. And as I indicated earlier in the talk, by 30 days, that contrast is completely gone. Six months, uh, it's gone. It has uh, stayed gone ever since. So uh, this is just an example of the two boys that had cerebral uh, ALD from this early trial. So in, in summary, uh, the mechanism of cerebral ALD arrest is unknown, uh, but it's not really been achieved outside of hematopoietic stem cell transplant. I've showed you that gadolinium resolution at day 60, it correlates with early uh, neutrophil recovery, and those neutrophils should be donor. And then I've showed you that large cell doses from expanded hematopoietic cell products shortened recovery time and may provide overall clinical benefit uh, as we look at more and more kids that go through transplant. Thanks. Sure, uh, I'll try to keep us on time, but yeah, we have time for, for a brief question. So, so maybe you can repeat the question. Are there, so do you think uh, what, what's <laughs> contributing to guidance uh, resolution might be something beyond the CD34 cells? Uh, if you're comparing conventional transplantation to uh, our current gene therapy, uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a truly interesting question of biology that gets at the mechanism of disease and disease resolution. So there are, there are two things in common. Both gene therapy and transplant utilize CD34 cells, right? So they're using the same fundamental cell type. So, so they, the cells themselves might be playing a role in vascular repair or attenuation of inflammation or attenuation of ROS. The other thing we can't rule out is some other cell type completely different, like a, a CD90 cell, which is a very primitive stem cell that's probably present in both gene therapy mobilized products and it's also present in umbilical cord blood. So I think it could be either of those things uh, or other mechanisms. A graft is probably important because uh, kids with graft failure don't resolve their gadolinium as well. But they're often uh, kids in poor clinical shape to begin with, so some of that's not as cut and dry. Yes. Uh, that was great. Uh, what do you think those uh, expanded cells engraft better? Sorry. The expanded cells in the mouse model uh, experiment? They, exp uh, they engraft better than the non-expanded uh, cells. Could you speculate why this may be? <laughs> yeah. Just number. It's, it's, it's no, the number is so high. It's a hundredfold higher. So it's the same type of cells. It's just more of them. Correct. It's not better quality of cells that or other, other capacities. That we don't know either. Okay. This was purely to generate the numbers of cells, and so it's 
that was the goal. Uh, high level question. What is your general response to the wacky world of stem cells? I mean, it's going everywhere. There's stem cell, cl everything, you know, it's like there's a million different stem cells. What's your general response to all of that wackiness that's going on right now? Uh, these are the only stem cells I have faith in. <laughs> right, it, it's true, there's a, there's a lot of, I mean, there's these charlatan stem cell clinics where they're giving cells from a vial into people's spinal columns and things like that. And, <clears throat> I mean, th that's just a bad idea to begin yet with. Some of those things have been investigated and they've shown that most of what's in the vial is dead. Yeah. They're dead cells. And so I can't promote or even be part of any of that stuff. As far as <clears throat> stem cells causing remyelination and things like that, it's still pretty far away from being put into a human being. Uh, it hasn't gone beyond the mouse. But So when I think about stem cells, these are my stem cells. Do you account for the chemo? I always thought the chemotherapy could also <coughs> lower the GAD a little bit in the beginning. When you compare the groups, is mm -hmm. there certain chemotherapies that maybe yeah, changed how fast yeah. it's, it's It's a really good question. Um, and I, I don't have the answer yet. I can tell you that the, the kids with the intense chemo, they resolved a little faster. The other thing I can tell you is that across diseases, chemotherapy can be thought of as sometimes anti-inflammatory, like fludarabine itself. It has anti-inflammatory properties because it removes your lymph lymphocytes entirely so they don't have that mechanism. But it's not the complete story um, because if you give somebody a transplant and they auto-engraft, uh, that gadolinium comes back. So, but there is something to it. I've seen it in, in skin disorders. Like kid, we have transplant kids with uh, epidermolysis bullosa and their skin is highly inflamed. Right after the chemo, it, it calms down for a little bit. And so there's some effect there. Troy, thank you so much for, for the presentation. One question, the number of cells that are, you're infusing back, uh, they could turn into a more viscous kind of transient state. Do you change the way you're infusing these cells? Have you seen any complications with microthrombosis yeah. or a, anything getting clogged? Always, always a good question to think about it when you're dealing with uh, those high, high numbers. Not really. Not really. It, you know, cord blood transplants are very small transplants, if you've ever seen one. They're only like this big, literally. And so our ability to expand what's inside a hundredfold um, is not problematic. So we've never seen a thrombus or anything like that. Um, so the, bo the body tolerates it perfectly well. Great. And my last question is, you didn't see an association with Lowe's score? Have you looked at volume of lesions? Oh, yeah, that, that'd be something great to look at. We haven't. We haven't looked at the volume.